to the Spectrum Theater Ensemble seminar on parenting. Uh, my name is Michael John Carley, and I am someone who wears a lot of different hats in the autism Asperger world. Uh, and I'm going to first off, just in a generic sense, uh, ask the panelists, starting with myself, to introduce sort of who you are in our world, as well as ask if you have some kids. Um, I would like you to tell me what those kids' ages are, and then I would like you to tell me which ones are on the spectrum. And from there, we'll sort of take it there. Uh, as, as most folks know, I am an individual with autism. I have two children aged 15 and 24. The older one is on the spectrum. Uh, the younger one is not. And I'm, like I said beforehand, somebody who wears a lot of different hats in the autism Asperger world. I'm I'm look upable, so I won't go into great detail. Uh, but I've been very, very lucky, and I'm especially excited to uh, be able to share these wonderful panelists with you here today. I'm going to tag Elaine to go next. Okay. Well, first of all, what a joy to be with all of you, and Michael, one of my favorite humans on the planet. So what a what a what a gift. The this morning, so thank you. Well, this afternoon for you, but I guess it's afternoon. Um, I am the mother of a 26, almost 27-year-old um, adult son on the spectrum, and uh, he's non-speaking, autistic. Um, so I'm, I also now qualify and identify as neurodiverse myself, and um, yes, um, and uh, with sensory differences and... and um, very excited about that and um my work is is in this field so i wear a bunch of hats as well and happy to share on a project that i that i need to leave early for but um just very excited to be here did i answer all the questions yes you did yes you did okay. and in typical parent fashion um we will just to let audience members know that we do have a couple of people that have to leave one is for a work reason and the other one is for a parenting reason and that's part of the, the, the you know, the, the deal that you sign up for when you become a parent. Um, Miranda Kay, would you go next? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Miranda Kay Giwa Onaiwu. Um, I am an autistic adult. I was diagnosed after the diagnoses of my two youngest children. Um, I have six children. I'm an adoptive and biological parent and got I'm not going to say their ages because it makes me cry because I'm getting so old, but they go from elementary, middle, high school, and college. And so they're amazing um, from Togo, from Liberia, from Sierra Leone, and from the womb. And um, the younger two are the elementary and middle school ones are the ones that are um, autistic. Um, in terms of our community, um, my um, I'm a two-year college professor, and I'm also a humanities scholar at Rice University, but I do a lot of volunteer work um, in um, our community. I'm board member of a number of different groups, Foundation for Divergent Minds, and um, former board member of Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network and Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Um, I work with the um, Brandeis University, the uh, Brandeis, I can't say that word. I always see it in writing. I've never heard it spoken aloud. Um, the parenting project there as well as with the Institute for Exceptional Care. And because I got to go pick up one of my kiddos, um, I'm going to um, either switch to my cell phone or hang up early, but I'm excited about this conversation. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Anlor, would you go next? Sure. Um, well, it's good to see all of you. I am honored to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Anne Lore Devon, and well, first off, I have to say, I'm sure, because everybody hears my accent usually, <laughs> that I was born and raised in France, uh, but I came to the United States when I was 23 years old, so that was a long time ago. <laughs> so, okay, then uh, I will tell you about my son. Well, I'm autistic, by the way, I should say. Um, I have a 29-year-old son uh, whom I raised a lot alone, um, mostly, but, uh, you know, in very autistic ways. Anyway, uh, and uh, also my interest these days is um, Zen meditation, and I actually teach 
uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, I started online. I mean, my partner and I had this group before where we teach, we, well, we have meditate, we offer meditation, we have a retreat once a year, and we had in, in person meetings. But anyway, nowadays, it's three times a month, I am doing it online. Uh, and uh, everybody, it's free. And uh, everybody who's interested is welcome to uh, join in. You can register at um, autsit.net and uh, autsit.net. And then uh, lastly, I wrote a book called Being Seen uh, that was published. I am going so fast, like five years ago or so or more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, it's on Amazon. And, you know, I talk more about my autistic experience anyway. But anyway, meditation, that's what I'm mostly about. Thank you. Thank you. Anlar, it's been so long since you and I saw each other. And if I just mispronounced your name and that it's Anlor and not Anlor, I apologize deeply. So Anlor will not make that mistake again. It doesn't matter that much. Okay. Bless you. Bless you. Erica. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's so wonderful to be here. And I'm, I'm honored to be on this panel with so many incredible humans. I am a parent to one kiddo on the spectrum who is 16 and another who is neurodivergent who is 15 and I have one on the way. Um, so not certain if that kiddo is neurodivergent yet, but, but I suspect probably. Um, and my, my husband is also autistic and he was diagnosed after all this was diagnosed, which I think is a, a common theme for humans of his age. Um, I am a nonprofit executive. That's been my entire career. I currently work at Providence Public Library as their director of external relations. But before then, I was at the Autism Project in Johnston, Rhode Island, serving as their director of development and communications. Um, so consider myself an ally, an advocate, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to ask a question about, um, because we have a lot of folks that the parents are kind of on or off the spectrum in, in different ways here. And I think that that's a very, very valid question to address next. But I would first, I think, like to just look at parenting itself. And if all of you could maybe just sum up, you know, in a few sentences or a few thoughts, because um, obviously this is a subject that we could go on and on about, but what are sort of some of your just basic ideas about parenting and, and what your values are? as a parent first, before we get into the autism aspect of things. Um, you know, and it can be, you know, what's the justification for bringing a child into this world? Or it can be nature versus nurture conversations, just whatever kind of comes to mind, I think I would love to hear. Um, and Laura, why don't I start with you this time? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna mix it up. Keep me so stay on your toes, everybody. Um, you know, what are my views about parenting? Hmm. Well, you know, we all do the best we can. <laughs> my views is that I am not perfect, nor is my son, nor is anybody, as far as I know. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I. I really want, well, my, my practice comes, uh, happens when he was, uh, I started to meditate when he was 10 year old or less than that. I forget 21 years ago and he's 29. So you do the math. Okay. Uh, and, um, it changed everything in the way I parented him. Uh, meaning like, uh, after, after I started the practice, I found myself really playing with him, not just to, you know, get him busy and all of that and happy. It's, you know, it was a play, the two of us playing. So, you know, that that's basically what I want to say. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. We're looking My for thought? anything that comes to mind. Okay. Erica. I could say so many things, <laughs> but I think what... I think what first comes to mind for me, is that I, I think you know, parenting to me is about helping our children be who they are in the world and be who they were meant to be in the world. And like that's individual to them. And that involves 
a great deal of listening as a parent and I think letting your child lead and teach you because so often you know I feel like they they know where they need to go and they know how they need to get there and I think it's my job as a parent to to listen to what that is and learn what that is and help make that happen for my kids and you know it's different for every child is so different and that's what's so wonderful about humanity um you know and obviously that that can be a challenge too but i think it's a beautiful challenge um and i think one of my favorite parts of parenting is is how much i have learned from my children and i really take that to heart thank you miranda Kay. So I had a, something that popped in my mind and then I started thinking about um, the recent death of um, hip hop artist DMX and who was also a parent and neurodivergent um, and among other things. And so I was like, you know, instead of saying my quote, I'm going to say something by DMX. But the only thing I could remember were song lyrics. And I was like, that's not going to work. So, but then just as I was scrolling on my phone, I found something and I was like, wow, this, it, you know, it works. And what he was saying is basically, this is what I think about when I think about parenting. He said, I don't have to be working on an album to, um, to prepare and love a song. And so I think about like a lot of things about parenting, it's about becoming and helping your children to shape and become the person that they need to be the best person they are. It's about being real. It's not about, um, honey, I'm gonna go pick him up. Yes, <laughs> sorry, um, it's about that kind of stuff, working together, but it's about, um, you are you want to be that authentic and person with integrity and ethics so that they can there's no such thing as do what i say not as i do you want to model for them that it's okay to not know everything it's okay to say that you're sorry it's okay to make mistakes i think that we're not we talk about raising children but i would think we're all growing up as we raise our children and i think it's like one of the most um humbling uh, stretching <laughs> um joyful, uh, tear-inducing, tear <laughs> laughter-inducing, stress-inducing experiences. The, the, I guess it's the gamut of emotions. Like it, you know, it, that definitely an experience that I think that has made me a better person. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Thank you. Blaine. Mm. So um, I, I've worked, my work is with children and I've worked with children my entire life um, as an acting coach, as a dance teacher, as working in TV and film. And um, I knew I wanted to be a mother my entire life. I kind of wanted to be the old woman in the shoe with like what so many children should know what to do. And that's actually become my life is my career. Um, and I wasn't able to give birth biologically. It was, it was heartbreaking for me. Um, so I feel that my my higher source, God, my guidance, whatever, found me my son. And I was fortunate to adopt this extraordinary um, little boy from an orphanage in Russia. And so when he came to me, I, I had no ego invested. It wasn't like I wanted him to be, um, you know, mini me or whatever. It was about discovery of who is this extraordinary person. And you know, as, as as Erica so beautifully said, it was about him teaching me who he was and, and um, being curious, being, listening, and, and just wanting him to, um, to thrive in whatever, in whatever way he could. And uh, when he first came to me, he, uh, well, I, I went to meet him in Russia, which was the most amazing moment of my life, when our hearts bonded together and I, it was like a an emotional umbilical cord. I've heard that when you when you give um, birth to a child, you gain an extra heart. And I feel personally giving birth. Uh, my son has says thank you for having me from Russia. Um, but it was like I gained an extra soul, like an extra soul came in that just guided me through every step of the way. And and all my main goal was to um, always make sure that if I heard that little voice inside of me, to follow it. And that my only regret in life would be 
not listening to that voice and then knowing that I'm doing the best I can in every situation. And I became a single parent for a while and, um, and then adopted, uh, adopted. <laughs> and then was, was brought a, a wonderful man into my life who, who shared um, my son's growth with me. But parenting is the greatest honor, the greatest gift. And um, for me, some of the challenge was in letting go. Uh, first in letting go of what I thought my life was gonna look like and then embracing how extraordinary it is. And then every step of the way, every achievement, every challenge, the first time he took the school bus, you know, every moment was a letting go and uh, really allowing him to flourish. I mean, the, the day he moved into his own apartment, you know, I thought he's, gonna, he's gonna wanna come home tonight. And instead he was like, see you later, mom, you know, out of here, letting go. And letting myself grieve when I needed to grieve that, that letting go process and, and grow myself up. So parenting um, has been a, a matter of trusting the higher, highest good, his highest good, and um, just allowing him to be the best person he can possibly be. That's awesome. Um, I'm even going to come up with an impromptu follow-up question for you all based on what you just said, because the letting go aspect of things um, is especially prevalent, I think, with Spectrum kids. And one of the things that I, you know, remember very strongly from my days running GRASP, which it's not much now, but it used to be the largest membership organization for adults on the spectrum in the world. And um, I founded that like almost 20 years ago, so I'm getting old. Um, and one of the things that you sort of saw from afar as not because you were in a great brain, brain but just because of what your job was, um, was that there was this unmercifully cruel catch-22 that the fates enacted on those parents who had to be such guardians to protect their kids from all the stigma and ignorance, especially 15, 20 years ago for Spectrum Kids. And it was like the cruelest thing imaginable to them because those were the parents that had the hardest time letting go mm. when it was time. And the, the breakups were ugly, you know, and they had to be done with a crowbar. Anybody care to sort of speak to that very challenge? I won't go person by person on this one. Just feel free to jump in. No, everybody's just nodding their heads like, yeah, no. no I, <laughs> it's gotta I, suck. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm like, they're not, we're not old enough yet for all that. So I don't have much to say, but I've been, it's something I've been thinking about quite a bit because of the fact that I also think about the fact that societally, um, so my family is from West Africa, although I was born here in the US and, and I mentioned to you all, my children are internationally adopted. And so in our culture, it's not like a bad thing. Like it was so odd to me when I was, you know, it, in America, it's like somebody, oh, he's 19. He lives at home with his mom. He's a jerk. Ugh, he's a jerk. I'm thinking, huh? He's 19. Well, he just graduated. I mean, can he go to college? Can he get a job? Like this idea that growing up has to happen. I mean, all, all cultures have this societal clock and this timeline, but, um, you know, it wasn't, it isn't apologized for someone to stay home if you're trying to, you know, get things together to improve your life and so on. And that's with neurotypical people, you know, um, now it might be more stigmatized as people become more Westernized, but it wasn't the case, you know, we kind of have like intergenerational stuff. So I think about that aspect. And then the fact that it worries me that like, I want them to be able to have their independence if that's what they want. I want them to be able to stay home and prepare themselves if that's what they want. I think that a lot of times in life and you're still trying to figure things out and changing, I know that I, you know, I, I ventured out on my own very young, spent a lot of time on my own, and it wasn't always the best thing, but it was what I felt that I needed to do, you know, like you're trying to prove something um, to yourself and to the world. And um, I think that, I, I feel like letting, you're letting go of the, maybe the grasp, but you're not letting go of the touch, you know, like there's still, a t you know, you're still always the mom I mean I can call my mom now and she's still my mom you know I still get her advice and stuff like that you know I'm fortunate to still have my parents and um so I, I guess I just I feel like 
it is, you do have to shelter them. You do have to protect them. You do have to guide them. You do have to be that mama bear. And then yet you also have to let them experience the world too. You have to find this weird balance between the two. And so the best thing that I think, so what I've tried to do is because I, I, I don't know what it is that they're going to want. I try to prepare them for either way. So if you're going to be on your own, I want you to know how to sort laundry and wash clothes and do chores and, you know, things related to money and communicate with people and things like that. And if you're going to be, if you're going to be at home, that's fine. Utilize that to your advantage. You're not paying, you know, having to pay rent and stuff like that. Save money, do things that are wise, you know, better, you know, improve your life. So, um, but I feel like there's so much push in the disability community for independent living, interdependence. And I think um, independence is good. If that's so, I think a person absolutely should have the desire and the ability to, but I think that it's almost made like you're a failure if your kid didn't get out at this period and is living on their own, even if that's not where they want to be, you know. Yep, I hear you. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. So here we have maybe the first uh, parent, or not the first, but the highest, out of all the parent panels that have been done in the autism world for the last 50 years, I'm going to go out on a crazy limb and I'm going to say that this panel has the highest percentage of parents on the spectrum that's ever been seen on the face of earth. So with that, um, and not to exclude anybody or be, be, be you know, be that, the conversation about um, what it means to be the parent on the spectrum as well as having spectrum kids I think is one that we would be really you know um, not doing our audience a, a service whatsoever by ignoring and I will tell you you know right off the bat I'll even start with an example for myself that when I first started to catch wind of other people's ideas about what my parenting capabilities were as a person on the spectrum and having a kid on the spectrum, um, I was almost incredulous that they could be worried about my abilities because I looked at them, the neurotypical parents, and I saw them saying, oh God, I hope he has the chance to have a life. I'm praying that he has the chance to have a life because of his autism. Oh God, you know, and just all this, you know, faith or belief or what have you. I had a weird life, but I had a life. I had a career. I had a relationship that was pretty good. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't hope that my kid has a chance. I know my kid has a chance because I'm okay. I'm fine. I made it out, you know, fairly well. Not a lot of people do. So I should be very, very grateful. But this idea of, you know, anxiety and worry over your kids chances i just didn't have that now obviously our kids can falter and our kids can fall and life can get in the way as well but this idea that the diagnosis was going to doom them to an unhappy existence i didn't have that worry neurotypical parents did erica take it away <laughs> well speaking as a neurotypical um and my experience I don't know about that, Erica. I get a vibe from you. I'm not saying you're a kid, but I get it. Is I'm just that, saying. Yeah, I, I probably should. <laughs> it's cultural, Marina I do think you're neurodivergent. I don't think you're autistic, but I think you're all, there's something. It's, it's, I, it's I, nurture I versus nature, Marina. case you're surrounded. I wouldn't disagree, but I, I, yeah, I do feel, you know, I, my, my husband is an incredible parent. He is such an incredible parent. And I think we talk a lot about being a neurodiverse couple in particular because there's there's so little out there about that dynamic and that relationship and what's out there as you were saying michael just feels very negative um and and not positive and powerful and that's what our relationship is you know and when i see sam with the kids first, first of all something i i love about you know and we we're, we're leveraging our strengths as partners right um, and I think that's really important as individuals in the relationship and as parents, you know, we have determined, you know, we think we figured out like, where are our strengths here? How do we best support the children? And let's focus on those things, you know, and that helps when it comes to both of our deficits, PS, by the way, <laughs> right? I have them and so does my husband. Um, but, you know, I think, I think there's, how he sees the world has been so and official and how he is helping the children become themselves and who they were meant to be. I think there's an automatic honesty um, 
you know, and, and the way that he speaks with them and authenticity that is missing sometimes in parenting that is so vital. And I love that about like our family and the openness there um, and the trust. So I, I think that is such a strength as someone looking at him as someone on the spectrum who is a parent. Um, you know, and I think something else too that I appreciate is, you know, his ability to set boundaries with the kids. And that's important because it's modeling for them as well. Like, this is how I need to operate to take care of myself as a parent, as a human being. And he's modeling that for them, you know, like, and, and what those are for all, all of us in the family are, are very different. Um, but I think it's, it's such a great practice of self-care and self-advocacy within relationships, within family. What does everybody need? And, and he really models that very well. And I think it's helped both of my kids to model that for themselves then and take that into school and into their other relationships. Like, you know, what, what works best for me here? What do I need in this scenario to be the best person I can be in this relationship? I was muted there. I don't know how I got muted, but, um, and Laura, how about you as a spectrum parent? Well, uh, I I love um, all what you guys are saying. I mean, I, I, I so agree, you know, I, I, for myself, I'm, I did not want to, um, I feel like I was really in a way because of the time, probably, you know, um, maybe now things are different, but I was really, I feel um, lucky not to be diagnosed because yes, give hope to our children. You know, there is that idea that, well, you cannot take care of your child or, or the child cannot, you know, uh, do this or that. And it's like, excuse me. So I did not. So what it comes down in terms of my son is I really did not want to push down with any type of labeling. Anyway, he did not have, he was not impaired like I was. So that was, an easy one you know but he definitely had some traits but hey I mean he so you know and, and for me it really matters like Michael was saying you know um, what a strange idea to think that you know I cannot raise my son because I am autistic or but I never really had to deal with it thank God because I was not diagnosed until when he was 16 so I don't know how it would have been though if I had been before because I hear so many parents who have this problem you know once you're diagnosed I even know a mother who doesn't really want to say that she's diagnosed because then what happens you know so I feel very fortunate and my son and I are just like that it doesn't really matter what label or whatever I think okay Elaine so much I was thinking about with this. Um, one of is I was kind of diagnosed by my dear friends who, who are on the spectrum. And um, you know, I've always felt like an outsider looking in and highly sensitive and um, uh, naive. And I mean, so many other things and the hypersensitivity, especially um, the sensory challenges that I just tried to make sense of and pretend I mean, I've been acting since I was, you know, a kid in, in order to pretend to be in the world. Um, and yet, really accepting my, my neurological differences has given me a place in the world. So, um, and I'm, I'm successful and I'm incredibly resourceful and scrappy. And I think these are qualities that, that you know, we, we have to learn and, and that we could teach, teach our children. I mean, people used to say to me, oh, you're talking to your son like he's just like everyone else. I'm like, yeah, um, because I'm talking to him the way I had always wished people had spoken to me. You know, I understand his sensory sensitivities because I feel them. I hear things that others don't hear and they think they're not there, but I hear them. They're there. You know, I sense things and he senses. So my my parenting was really um, just so tuning in to his sensitivities and then also finding what excited him, what he was passionate about in life and then giving him that 
which is what I, you know, my parents beautifully did that with me. They, they, they knew what my passions were and just, you know, helped me, have guided me that way. Um, so, but I think because of my hypersensitivity and, and neurological differences, I was able to tune into him in ways that pe other people uh, may not see. I mean, my son is non-speaking autistic and he has a job and he's living independently because he wants it. And he's, you know, wants to, <laughs> he wants to act and that's my field. So I'm getting him acting jobs, you know. It just didn't even occur to me that he couldn't do the things that he wants. So um, I, I do believe that because of my own knowing, very similar, Michael, what you were saying, that, that I had to make my way in this strange world. Why, why not him? And that my mission is to make the world more uh, receptive and understanding and compassionate and curious about all of us and our kids. And because he's, he's just got to do it, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Miranda Kay, are you available to talk in your car somewhere? <laughs> Shoot. No? No, I guess Hold not. Hold on, you guys, it's beeping. Oh, there she is. Okay, cool. Oh, Miranda Kay, you're... Uh, okay, you're... so hi, everyone. So there she sorry, is. All right, you. Oh, you're getting... You're very blurry, <laughs> though. Okay, so I'm going to turn the camera off, but just talk, and I'll try to figure out this blurriness. Okay, great. Um, Bless you. Sorry about that. No, it could fine. be where I'm positioned, everyone. Sorry. I think I'll pick up the kiddos, but yeah, let me turn the camera off temporarily. Um, or is it any better? It's a little better, but you Still know what? Blurry. I actually okay. do know from experience that turning the camera off does usually guarantee some audio uh, improvement. So as much as I love looking at you. Okay. Um, so I'll Bless be you. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so I've been listening to everything everybody's sharing, and I've been like, oh my goodness, yes. Oh my goodness, yes. You know, because it's like, I think about, I wasn't, um, you know, my experiences, so my children were diagnosed before me, and so in addition um, to, um, you know, autism, we have other, you know, all of my children have, you know, multiple disabilities, um, most of which are, quote unquote, invisible. So, um, but, you know, autism is actually kind of like the most benign, frankly, um, in terms of, you know, how, you know, it impacts one's life. But, um, Miranda Kay? To make, yes. Yeah, we lost you. You you said the words impact one's life, and then we lost you, you for a few um, seconds. Hear me? Uh, not really. Miranda K, can you do me a oh, favor? Oh, sorry about that. So I was that, gonna... That's okay. Still a um, bad connection? <laughs> yeah, still a bad connection. I tell you what, um, can, if you can still listen, sure. when you're... That. When you're sure that you can get to like a stable connection, call us back and then we're just going to give you the floor to answer all the questions that you missed. <laughs> Does that work? I see a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> okay, that means it works. So let's see. Did we get everybody then on that question? I guess, you know, one of the next questions really then is, um, that comes up usually, especially amongst neurotypical parents, is the whole notion about the cultural sort of you know push that you might give your kids to open up the conversation about their particular diagnosis. And Anne Laura, you had you know sort of mentioned a little bit of this already. Um, and I wonder you know what everybody's uh, opinions might be or take on like at what age do you tell them? Uh, if, if you tell them, um, and, um, you know, if so, in what context, are there any great tricks? Um, are there any telltale signs as to when it is? I mean, I'll be honest, I'll, I'll start us off by saying, I always sort of believed in, in the idea that it, the earlier, the better, um, especially because when puberty comes, kids are figuring out who they are enough as it is, and to throw this stuff into the mix just is almost torturous. I mean, it's just too much. Um, so I always sort of figured that I would do it when my younger, when my older son uh, noticed himself that he was being ostracized from the world, and he was seven. And my wife and I were on a beach one time, and 
he did what he does or did at the time almost you know like every week where you'd see him on a playground a group of kids would be playing and he would saunter over to do, 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 do and try and integrate himself into that play dynamic and it wouldn't work out you know just too weird whatever blah 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 and but he'd be oblivious to any feelings of ostracization and he'd just be like do, 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 that's okay i'll just go play with my trucks now and no biggie and there was just this one time again on that beach he's seven years old where he came from that same experience and he came back to my wife and i and he said what's wrong with me and that moment it was an instant now let's go for a walk we're going to talk about this i've got something to tell you and he was fine because then he figures out it's about my wiring not about my character erica yeah, so i completely agree with you michael i think and i feel like actually this is true about so many i don't know quote unquote taboo topics like sex for example <laughs> um you know i think there's a way to age appropriately talk about this stuff as it happens when it comes up you know um no matter where your kiddo is and you know for us we've always you know integrated that conversation about who the kids are, you know, every step of the way. And it's because we want to have that information about themselves. And I think it's empowering to have that information about yourself, you know, in a way that you can understand it. And we've used that same terminology about, you know, how our brains are wired. And I think, you know, when Dev was diagnosed, she was 10, she was already a little older and had definitely already, you know, had several experiences of feeling different, not being sure why. Um, you know, she was different from her peers. So I think for her, when we were talking to her about the diagnosis at that time, uh, the, the light bulb went off and she was like, oh, <laughs> okay, this makes sense for me now. And it's funny because my husband actually talks about the same experience when he got diagnosed at 40, being like suddenly 40 years of my life makes so much more sense. And like, I, I can understand it in a way that I never ever did before. Um, so, you know, I almost feel like there's no age where it's, you know, your child is too young to have this conversation. You're just doing it, you know, in the ways that they can understand and approach it. And I think it, it really does help, you know, help them understand themselves and ultimately empowers them to feel good about who they are. So, Elaine Hall, I want to tell everybody, is one of my heroes also because a long time ago when we in the autism world were just fighting each other like cats and dogs. A lot of the arguments centered on people like me assuming the same label as significantly challenged kids and how their parents would feel inordinately resentful and towards that because they really wanted ownership of the word to be used in a tragic context and to use the medicalized model um, and to bring maybe I thought at the time more attention to quote unquote, their suffering then was just not necessary or, or legitimate, but emotionally healthy because it wasn't emotionally healthy to respond in that way. And what they needed, I thought at the time to understand was that if they had anger and overwhelmed issues, it was because they weren't getting the services that they were entitled to and they deserved. And to enact a competition of suffering amongst other people with significant challenges was just, you know, textbook farce. And Elaine Hall has always been one of my deep heroes uh, because of the fact that she always went the humanist route, despite a kid who, while still being a fabulous kid, um, is has had very, very cha big challenges. And, you know, so especially from your perspective, Elaine, on this, you know, how did you share with your kiddo um, his autism and how did that develop in terms of his sense of identity? So, so beautiful, Michael, and thank you. Um, so right from the get-go, we've been really, I've always been very straight with Neil. Um, he knows he's adopted. He knows he came to me from Russia. Um, maybe this is part of my neurodiversity is, I'm just learning really, um, is that I, I'm gifted and cursed with just being, with telling the truth and not, um, having to be able to not ha having the ability to not. Um, so it was just very simple, you know, this is where mom, this is where we, you know, came from showing him pictures of his adoption. And um, <clears throat> he had some extremely severe challenges and still does, you know, periodically um, in non-speaking. 
and not getting his needs met and, and things like that. And so I would say to him, this, this is your autism talking. This isn't you. This isn't your highest. Your, your soul is pure. This is the way you're, um, I don't think I use the word wired, but I would say this is the way your neurosystem works, you know, and it works differently and you're highly sensitive. And so I would kind of take things apart with him. And um, just from the beginning, you know, it's like your soul, you know, it's like, you know, we're all one. It's just your body. And we'd say your body a lot. I learned that from Darlene Hansen. Um, Darlene would say your body, you know, and, and we'd connect the, the brain and the heart and, and the mind to the body. And um, so much so that there was a time where, and he said, it's okay if I tell about this story. So I, I hope it's okay. But there was a time where he went to a camp and they wouldn't allow me to bring a support person. And, um, and you know, like at five o'clock, I got a call. Oh, he's doing fine. I'm like, okay, great. I'm in Santa Barbara. I'm going to have a drink of wine, you know, some wine, you know. And um, then at seven o'clock, I got the call. Get your kid out of here, you know. He's having the, you know, he's ripping things down and did it. And I knew it's because he didn't have a support person. So um, my now husband, he was my, my uh, um, boyfriend at the time. But anyway, he went to pick, pick me all up. And the very next day, I said, hey, man, what, what happened? What, what went on there? And he said, um, he types my apraxia. The apraxia was his inability to speak. So he immediately was able to identify why did he have such a mess? You know, why such a blow up? Well, his apraxia. He couldn't tell people what was going on. You know, so I, I just feel... And I always have that um, the more he knows about his own body and the way his neurosystem works and the way his mouth and his tongue sometimes work and sometimes doesn't, the more, um, the more ability he's going to have to advocate for himself and to, to not, you know, a lot of our kids, and I find this even, I, I, I run a theater program called The Miracle Project, and we really talk about what's going on with ourselves and our bodies and our emotions. And so often, it makes me, my heart break and sad, is the qu quickest thing to do is to go to shame, you know, because our bodies, our neurosystem isn't reacting a certain way. There must be something horribly wrong with me and the shame. And so I think, you know, just in order to extinguish the shame, because I hate that word extinguish, you know, but to just to go, okay, this is how I, this is how I roll, you know, and, and own that and love ourselves tremendously in it and, and to let our support people um, be there to help us when we can't regulate ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Laura, before we get to you, I want to tell you a story that maybe I hope opens up the realm for you to maybe feel even more comfortable talking about you know this concept of labels because so very often our decisions about how comfortable we should be about talking about this stuff is dependent on the culture in which we find ourselves and how they judge you and that's going to sometimes dictate and not theory how we handle these conversations with our kids and i i think i actually told this in the in the panel we recorded yesterday so hopefully i won't be you know redundant to people watching too many panels but there was through the years i've had a lot of um really just nice opportunity as far as media exposure is concerned and i had a policy though about my son because a lot of inquiries were made and uh, uh people weren't allowed to take his picture and they weren't allowed to use his real name and they weren't allowed to use or mention the school that he went to. But if he wanted to you know, come along for the interview you know, um, and they had been asking for him as well, that was, that was fine. So he's 15 years old though. It's a little bit late in all this stuff for him. And we get interviewed by a guy who's writing a book on the DSM. And while I'm discussing how imperative it was for me at the age of 36 when I got diagnosed to find out that I wasn't an asshole and I wasn't a tell it like it is guy either, you know, that this was just kind of how that meant. And that for me, you know, the, the sense of identity, you know, was so, I'd been starving for that, 
you know, and it was really, I mean, I, I'd kind of compensated by, you know, entering into what I consider the life of service to others to offset the fact that I was maybe an asshole. Um, and yet at the same point, you know, my son spoke up in the interview with that author and he just said, yeah, but dad, you know, it's a different time right now. My buddy's in school, you know, they, they just don't need to hear that sort of stuff. And it just makes me look kind of, kind of weird. And what you regard as identity, I see as pathology. And I'm thinking, my 15-year-old knows the word pathology, you know? Wow, that's deep. <laughs> so, you know, there really are fluctuating ideas about this. And there can be environments in which labels are just really, really difficult for, for people. And Laura, I, I hope that was okay to say. Oh, okay. Why wouldn't it be? I, <laughs> you know, I... I, I'm not as articulate as you guys, I feel. <laughs> and I really like when Elaine was talking about that inability to speak at times, you know, because... So for me, it was when, when my son was 15 or 16 and I was diagnosed when I was 46 there, it was like, I never really said anything to my son. Um, I let him find out by himself, I guess, about autism. I mean, he knows his mom, he knows I am autistic, and I guess he had a first uh, view. I mean, I know that to many people, the way I look now doesn't look like, you know, that much, but what you see is my Zen practice a lot. We get older, you know? <laughs> and. Um, I, yeah, labels, what do they mean? I mean, I could have been put in an institution if I had been diagnosed earlier. Thank God I was not. And I could have been easily destroyed. You know, I feel like I've always been very um, easily, you know, my mind has always been very easily tickled, you know, very, very easily. So labels are really not helpful. We, I think we all agree to that. And that's what I'm going to end this with. What else can I say? Marenna Kay, I hear you're in a good spot. I am, but I'm, draw I'm about to drive by through what might be a bad spot, but I hope it won't work, mess me up. All right, fingers so crossed. So I've been listening to everything that everybody's sharing. And um, I just, I really agree. Like I think about, um, you know, similar to Elaine, I'm also an adopted parent. And so um, I have always, you know, I, I think about some of the advice that people have given through the years about lots of different things that are inappropriate or wrong. Like when they would tell people babies have to sleep or, or, or be fed on a certain schedule. If your child is adopted, don't tell them they're adopted. You know, have all these fake pictures of you with a pillow on your stomach and don't tell them to their 18. If, you know, all these different, you know, things that people have later found out those things are crap. Those are bad advice. And so in our home, we had you know, you know, pediatric heart disease, and we had immunological conditions, and we had this and we had that. So we already had a lot of things before we had, um, you know, autism and ADHD and all of that. We had other conditions that we were already dealing with. And, um, and I had tried to talk about them in a non-stigmatizing way. Um, and so with autism, it was kind of the same thing. I'm like, if I don't tell them till a certain age, I'm acting like this is some deep, dark secret, like it's some horrible thing. Then how, what kind of a message am I sending? This is so big, so bad. I can't tell you like, it's like, you know what I mean? That's just, and so, um, I believe children should know. I think it does them a disservice not to know. I think that, you know, uh, uh, we do need to think about each individual child, what's age appropriate. And, and they may want to just talk about it once and be done. And just, you know, maybe it's integrated into their life. You know, we don't want, we still want them to be a person. It's a part of who they are. It isn't everything about who they are, but I think it's, it's definitely um, something that's, um, you know, that's key that should be shared. Um, and quickly, I just wanted to go back to um, um, some of what was shared. I think of what you were saying earlier, um, Michael, about the fact that, you know, there have been some people who say, well, this term should be used for this group because they're experiencing autism this way and that way. And I think a lot, what a lot of um, autism parents the last few decades have forgotten is that there are a lot of disabilities out there and that impact a person's functioning in a lot of different ways. And everyone acts like autism is in this vacuum alone. And so thinking of myself as a, my oldest son has intellectual disability and has a, he is not autistic, but he has a lot of, of challenges with regard to communication, with regard to adaptive living, with regard to a lot of things. And he's still an amazing, amazing person. 
and we don't have the ability to utilize um, you know, like AAC and a lot of these things because of, you know, his cognition is challenging in terms of, you know, being able to, to utilize some of these words. Because he also has some other, um, you know, dysgraphia and a couple other things going on. But I think that people, um, you know, don't realize that there have been people who've been living since the beginning of time with various different conditions and they've still found a way to love and live their lives. Um, and so um, no one should be described as low or seen as low. Even if they say they have challenges, they're still worthy of the life that they have. Um, and quickly to go back to the thing about parenting, I know we, I don't want to take too much time, but I just wanted to say that um, a lot of what you all shared, I really agree with in terms of the stigma of autistic parenting. I think that people, I think that stigma extends to a lot of marginalized groups, just people with disabilities in general, um, families of color, single parents, older parents, younger parents, non-traditional families, like, you know, households who are same gender households. There's still 10 states in the United States where disability can be used as grounds to take away parental rights in the absence of neglect or abuse. You know, that's scary. Um, and so I experienced it myself in that before I knew about my diagnosis, um, I was literally honored with my husband as family of the year by our adoption agency, literally for, with a gala, you know, their fundraising gala and all these big wigs. And then the following year, we were in, in a law in a custody suit for them, where they felt that I was too um, impaired to be able to handle children who have quote unquote, high needs because I of my disability, the same exact disability I had when they honored me, the same disability I had when I was born. So there's a lot of misconceptions when in actuality, a lot of things about the way autism works helps me to raise to parents better, my um, focus and my, you know, being honest and real and um, being able to learn new things and figure things out. It's my neurotypical children that are a little more challenging to um, <laughs> raise than the autistic ones, frankly. Miranda Kay, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's very, very meaningful and important, I think, also just in terms of understanding, you know, the judgments, you know, that parents fall under. Um, I think of... I was a little bit of a street kid. I was raised by a, you know, a woman who was 19 years older than me. And my father had been killed in Vietnam, so it was just me and her. And so, you know, I had a little bit of that street kid type stuff. And if my kids were being raised the way I was being raised, um, my wife and I would be put under arrest. And yet at the same point, my mother was not negligent at all. You know, these were just different times and how you know the media involvement and all, all this sort of other thing has just evolved it's just you know amazing how we can try to quantify love um in in ways that are just you know it's the it's textbook sisyphean logic you're never going to get there um we should probably start to think about wrapping it up gang um what i would like to do is go back to each one of you and just ask for a final thought to close out this particular panel, and I will ask Elaine to start us off. Thank you. Um, I do want to say that I need to leave because I'm going to a table read of a, of a TV, new TV series that I'm working on, uh, directed by Jason Kadams. And I'm not saying that to brag about what I'm doing, but to say that um, he has always been a, a pioneer and an advocate for our, our community. And um, he has a new series that's gonna be on Amazon that stars three adults on the spectrum. And it's cast with three adults on the spectrum. And my role is to be an advisor, but also an advocate, and the world is changing. Um, so my last words are that we just keep showing up and doing what we're doing and invite the world to catch up. Um, I, I embrace being neurodiverse. Um, I don't want to say that I'm autistic because I honor the challenges specific to autism and I have my own set of challenges. Um, so I want to clarify, but I, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm there and just haven't you know, gotten the official diagnosis. Um, but just so feel so embraced by this community and that the neurotypical, and that's my awkward honesty coming forth, um, the neurotypical world needs to catch up to us. That's what I feel. And I feel that 
we're our children, we're the canaries in the coal mine. You know, I, I wrote a book called Now I See the Moon. That was my son's story. And my story, it's not my son's story. My story as a parent, learning and, um, and growing with having um, a, you know, a, a severely challenged son. And the, the, the essence really is that it's our opportunity. I don't even say our job. It's our opportunity to let our kids shine and to shine with them it's not, oh, you poor parent with a child with a disability. It's like, no, man, we rock. We have this community of extremely sensitive human beings that, that know and follow the truth. And um, that this is an incredible time in, 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 in culture because our voices are being listened to. There's show, TV shows being made for us and about us and with us. And... Um, you know, I, I really feel that, and not even, I mean, my son, my students, I teach, all my friends, I guess I'm included in this. We're the change makers and we have an opportunity and the world is, gonna, is ready to listen. I don't believe in Autism Awareness Month. I believe in, I'd be struck down by the people who have supported me, but I believe in appreciating every single day is autism awareness, appreciation, it's not even acceptance. It's learning and listening and growing. And um, I'll just close. I like to say, um, they say it takes a village to raise a child. I like to say it takes a neurodiverse person or a person with a disability to change the consciousness of a village. And really honored and proud to be with all of you. And Michael, I can't, every time I'm with you, I love you more. I don't know how that can happen. My, my heart just goes. <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. That's very sweet of you to say. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. Yeah. I'm excited to hear how it pieces together. Thank you. Miranda Kay, would Thank you go you. next? Sure. I don't, but she gave me a hard act to follow. I don't know, you know? But um, I guess I would say that what I would like to say to anyone listening is uh, um, the importance of trust. The importance of trusting your child that they know themselves um and trusting what they're able to do and you know and trusting yourself um, and that doesn't mean that we aren't going to be wrong we are going to be heck wrong and we need to learn and grow and change that's part of life failing so you can improve learning 999 ways not to make a light bulb that's how we grow by failure but i think that a lot of people get an idea in their head they're scared of the idea the concepts the words instead of the reality don't let the world tell you that you can't do this or you can't do that or your child will never do this or your child will never do that how the freak do they know you know what i mean they don't know so don't you know sell yourself short you know adapt to you know expectations but have trust and believe trust in your child trust in yourself um and grow and improve each day and that's what's most important that's what you know that's what we need more than any therapy more than any fancy funding you know we need supports and you know we need acceptance we need to, to be loved we need to have a whole life and so i just i'm um, so excited to hear about what elaine is doing um i'm recently uh, have, have co-edited a book called sincerely your autistic child what um, people on the autism spectrum um, wish their parents knew about um, acceptance growing up in identity and so it has 28 autistic authors and then two parents non-autistic parents and it's just people sharing their life and, and guiding parents on what they, you know, wish their parents would have known so that parents today can do better. And so it's at libraries and books. People are welcome to, to check it out. Just thank you so much for this conversation, everyone. Thank you, Marena Kay. It has been, I, I got to tell you, I just met Marena Kay on another panel yesterday, and it's, it's a new BFF. You are such a special, radiant, warm, and super smart human being. Just thank you so much for you know Thanks. everything that you've said. Honestly, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. And Laura, final thoughts. Um, well, sure. I actually uh, jotted down some some things, so maybe I'll I'll talk about that. I, I just wanted to say how important it is that the autistic person, whoever they are, you know, adult, child, uh, be accepted with their 
a good fla fragrant meaning everything you know <laughs> that their autism um, is and also that at some time they learn to fit into the uh, empty world i really feel like it's kind of um a little bit of a, a balance. I, I'm big into uh, balance, you know. In Zen, it's called the middle way, and I'm really into um, like you gotta, you know, you have to teach your autistic child to not zone out completely, but at the same time, I mean, you have to let them go swimming their own way, you know. I mean, it's it's just anyway. That's what my parting words are, and also thank you to all of you because I think we're all great persons here and I love to hear all what you had to say Erica and Michael and Morenike and Elaine thank you and also Spectrum Theater Ensemble <laughs> absolutely merci beaucoup mes amis <laughs> Erica I could talk to you all all day. <laughs> I just, I feel so lucky to be on this panel and to have had this conversation with such amazing human beings. So thank you all as well. Um, you know, I think for any neurotypical parents watching, um, I just like to, I want to reiterate what everyone has said. Um, you know, what a powerful, amazing, especially if there's any folks who, who just maybe discovered that their child is on the spectrum or is neurodivergent, um, you know, your kiddo is going to have an amazing life. Um, and I agree with what Elaine said earlier, looking at my 15 and 16 year old right now, um, you know, they're going to change the world. We just have to allow them the space to do it and help them be who they are and help them learn how to advocate for themselves. And in turn, they, they help us learn how to advocate for ourselves. And I think we, going back to the beginning, we talked about letting go, and I talked about learning from my children, but there's also a lot of unlearning that has to happen too. And I think that's very true for someone who's neurotypical. Um, and, and allow that process to happen. Um, you, you know, it can be messy, it's difficult, there's grief involved, uh, but it is incredible and powerful and you will be a better version of yourself uh, when you surrender to that process of, of unlearning what you quote unquote thought it meant to communicate, to be in relationship, uh, to do self-care. Um, I think it's, it's really important and I guess that's that's what I have to say. It's been such a joy to talk to you all. Thank you, Erica. Um, I'm going to close it off by dumbing it down a little bit and just sort of say that my final thoughts it was that you know the great thing for me about parenting was that I discovered as soon as the kid, first kid was born was that it wasn't about me anymore. And a lot of people get intimidated by that. And for me, that was actually very liberating. Because I think sometimes when you're on the spectrum, you know, you can't really figure other people out so much. So you just start focusing on yourself because that's an area that you can figure out. It's not that you're, so I think it was Tony Atwood who said, you know, we sometimes come across as being selfish, but we're not. What we are is self-involved and self-interested because our workings just fascinate us because they do um, go completely, you know, in contradiction to sometimes the way the world wor works around us. Um, my kids are my heroes. They are, you know, not only growing up in an environment which isn't the street kid environment I was in, you know, they're adapting to challenges that I've never seen before with this nature versus nurture world. And I also know that, you know, with all that confusion about the self that I was experiencing before I became a parent, that I didn't become anywhere near the human being I am until I had kids. You know, they just made me infinitely a better person. And, you know, as much as I like to be supportive and all that sort of jazz, I also was somebody who grew up without a father. And there is nothing more sometimes to my kids' consternation that I love saying more than I'm not your best friend, I'm your father. And with that, thank you all. This has been a wonderful, diverse group of folks telling diverse groups of stories, but and yet all on the same page. Big love, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. This was so awesome. Yep. Thank you, STE, for thank letting you, us STE. do this. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We yes. love y'all, Mario.
Teddy, all y'all. Amen. 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 Big love.